Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Christian Reformed Church on this first Advent Sunday. We are now in the season of Advent, the time where we are waiting for Christmas, the incarnation of Christ, Christ coming into our hearts, and the return of Christ. And so for the season of Advent, the church changes things up a bit. We focus on those things that are important, hope, love, peace, and joy, looking forward to Christ. And so many churches have a tradition of lighting candles for each of those virtues. And something that I like to do is to give an opportunity for our youth to be able to lead a little bit of the worship, leading us in a call of worship. And so I will ask for Jamie and Jill to come up and lead us in the call of worship. Hope is a... Let us pray. Source of light, burn in Yes. Thank you, Jill and Jamie. There is a light that God gives, and it is called hope. It is called Christ. It is also called peace, the peace of Christ. And this light can be shared among us and among the world if we're willing to reach out and share it. And so we practice that during worship, even if it's just a small way and right now social distance friendly way, but we share the peace of Christ. So I want you to turn to those who are with you, both also online, physically in the room with you, turn to them and pass them the peace of Christ. And then if you are able, text or call or email someone the peace of Christ. So let's take a time to pass this light. Let us rise together. Let's stand together and sing songs of glory, songs of praise to the Lord who gives us so much. So let's rise and sing. Let us sing. Whatever we see happening around us and wherever we are in our lives, we who are in Christ continue to live in confidence through our relationship with Jesus, the living hope, the holy righteous one. Let's praise and worship Jesus, the hope of the nations. Jesus, hope of the nations, Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in its circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In Bethlehem, a lowly birth, the dawn of grace and peace on earth. You are the hope, hope brought to life, here to reveal what God's really like. Light of the world, shining for everyone to see. You are the Christ. Christmas is you, our seventh king, faithful and true, Jesus our joy, filling our hearts as we receive our Prince of Peace. Jesus, hope of the nations. 
Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in the circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. And in Bethlehem, a lowly birth, the dawn of grace and peace on earth. You are the hope, hope brought to life, here to reveal what's God's really like. Shining for everyone to see. You are the Christ, Christmas is you, our servant king, faithful and true. Jesus, our joy, filling our hearts as we receive our Prince of Peace, our Prince of Peace. Our Prince of Peace, Son of God, Shaper of the stars, You alone, the Dweller of my heart, Mighty King, how beautiful You Son of God, Father's gift to us, you alone were broken on the altar of love, precious Lamb, our freedom's in your blood, it's in your blood, Jesus. sing to you, forgiven Savior, I'm overcome with your great love for me. Son of God, strength beyond compare, you alone the darkness cannot bear lord of love your kindness draws me near it draws me son of god prophecy of hope you alone redeem again and lead your people home. Come lead us home, Jesus, O oh, Holy One, I sing to you, forgiven Savior, I'm overcome.
The Lord has a great love for us. He gives us so much. And where Christ is, that's where we will be, both in his death and resurrection and his ascension and his returning. And so now we come to the learning of our faith, where we look at his ascension, where we ask a question of what do we believe about his ascension. So please hear this question and respond. Hear this question and respond. Of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension? Christ, Christ having, having physically ascended on our behalf, behalf just as he came down to earth physically on our account, is now advocating for us in the presence of his Father, preparing a place for us, and also sent us his Spirit to be with us. And so hear this. Hear this taken from the Gospel of John, both chapter 14 and 16. Hear these words of what Christ says. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Christ, where he is, we will be. And since Christ has gone to be with the Father, he has given the Holy Spirit and given us his wisdom, given us the ability to seek forgiveness, to confess our sins, and also knowing that he is there with the Father, advocating, hearing our prayers and bringing them before the Father so that they are heard. So now we come to our time of renewal where we will come together for prayers, confession, and intercession, trusting that Christ hears our prayers, hear our pleads. So please join me in this call and response prayer of confession and intercession. Righteous King, bringer of hope, we have been unrighteous, failing to live rightly with creation, neighbor, self, and above all, you. Forgive us, for we trust you, knowing that you stand in right relationship with all. You have shown this in the incarnation, in the cross, and in the empty tomb. So Lord, have mercy on us. And may, in this season of Advent, the world find hope in you, a God who acts in bringing peace and freedom. May we be a community of hope, relying on your righteousness to guide and mold us. May all be made well by God's amazing work. And so, trusting in God's amazing work, let us take a time of silent prayer, confessing our sins and asking the Lord to bring hope and peace and joy and love in this season. Let us take a time of silent prayer. O oh Lord, we put our trust in you. You are a righteous king. You, O oh Lord, are in the right. You stand before all of creation, calling it to return, calling it to be healed, calling it to hope and be at peace, to be joyful and to walk the ways of love. Lord, forgive us for ignoring these things, for not noticing the season, not noticing what is ahead of us, the babe of Mary, God in flesh, Christ in us, Christ returning. Forgive us, O Lord, of our sins, where we have spoken against your hope and peace and joy and love, where we have been distracted by things which are not you. Forgive us, Lord, and please hear our prayers, for there is much fear in the world. There is hopelessness. There is disaster. 
there is hate. Please, O oh Lord, help us in a time of flooding. Be with those who have lost their homes, their income, their security. Please, O oh Lord, mend the roads and reconnect us. Be with those who are trapped in the rain, who have no dry, warm place, who have no good companions. And be with those, O oh Lord, who are harmed by the virus. We pray, O oh Lord, protection from this new variant, protection from COVID. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we may keep alight the hope that this will fade away. For you, O oh Lord, are God of life, and life will be victorious. So, O oh Lord, who we wait for, we put all our trust in you. We confess to you and hope in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our King, we pray. Amen. And so let us now come together for a prayer, a prayer that Christ taught us, the Lord's Prayer. It goes. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now hear these words and respond. These words of grace taken from Romans chapter 12. Hear these words and respond. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice, Rejoice in hope. Be, be patient in tribulation. Be constant in, in prayer. Contribute, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And here are true words of righteousness, true words that the Lord lives out daily. And so let us hope that we can be renewed to follow this righteousness. And now let us stand together to sing about that righteousness, sing about that renewal. So let's rise together and sing. Let us sing. Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion in all that He has made. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from Transgressions from us. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion in all that He has made. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, from us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise 
the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Praise you, Father. Let's be seated. The Lord is compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love, and that is something to give thanks for. Yes, Christmas is coming. Yes, Christmas cheer, gifts, family. These are other things to give thanks for. And the Lord's righteousness and coming is also something to give thanks for. And so we come now to a time of thanksgiving, drawing to mind those blessings the Lord has given, those promises the Lord has given, and the promises the Lord has fulfilled. We come to give thanks. And we also come to pull our resources together to give as a thanksgiving offering. And so please know that you're still able to give an offering. We are still able to pull our resources together. We have offering boxes in the foyer. If you want to give through a physical means, you can come in the middle of the week if you want to be more social distance safe. Or if you are tech savvy, you can give through an e-transfer. So please go to the church website to learn how you can give through an e-transfer. But also be aware that when you are writing out a check or online banking, put Emmanuel Christian Reformed Church not ICRC, Emmanuel Christian Reform Church. And now let us come together for prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. O Lord, who gives us rain and wind, snow and sunlight, who causes the flowers to bloom and for the trees to shed their leaves, who gives us, O Lord, a roof over our head, and family and friends. Thank you, O Lord, for all that you have given. And thank you, O Lord, for the hope that we have in Christ, the hope that we have in the Lord's righteousness, the hope of Christ's return. Thank you, O Lord. And please receive from us our offering. Please, O Lord, receive our hearts, our time, our resources. And may they be used to share your message of hope, share your wonderful righteousness with others, that they may know the good news of Christ who is born, Christ who has died, and Christ who is risen and will come again. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. And now the children, they can go upstairs for Sunday school class. So kids, you can go straight upstairs up through those stairs in the back. I hope you have a good time. And for parents, if you're wondering where you pick up your kids, uh, we have a daycare door outside, so please pick them up outside through that door. That's where you'll find them. Uh, and also be aware the exit doors for when we are inside the sanctuary are the side doors where it says exit. But if you do have wheelchair needs, we do have a ramp in the foyer. Now for other news and things, Welcome, welcome again to Emmanuel Christian Reformed Church, everyone here and joining us online. Um, we are a community who wants to not be busy for busy's sake, but to be busy for fellowship's sake, for God's glory's sake, to share love and have good company. And so we are trying our best to have fellowship time, to be there for each other and remember each other. And so we have a few things in our church bulletin, some of the news on the back, if you ever need to be reminded in the week what's going on. One of the big things I should mention that is happening today, this is for church members, but it is the AGM meeting, the annual general meeting. Uh, that is uh, this, it is today, starting at 2 p.m., and it's via Zoom. It's going to be on Zoom. So please look for that link. It should have been emailed or given to you so that you'll be ready at 2 p.m. for the meeting. 
There'll be discussions, things laid out, and a time of voting. So please be aware of that. Also, uh, today is the beginning of Advent, the first four Sundays till Christmas. And so we are doing different things to try to live it out, to not just sit there twiddling our thumbs, but actually live out Advent, live out the waiting for Christmas. We have our Advent candles, and we also have a new daily office, a daily office that you can pick up a physical copy on the table in the foyer, or find a digital copy on our church website. It goes all the way until January 6th, so up until Epiphany. So please pick up your copy. It's got special scripture plan that are Advent focused and special prayers that are also Advent focused, waiting on that thing that we truly wait for. Now, it's one thing to have spiritual practices, but it's also to actually act out the things of God that Advent is about. And one of the things that we want to do, especially right now with the floods that have recently happened, is try to gather up resources and materials for those who've been hit by the flood, greatly affected by the flood. So we are right now collecting non-perishable items. Uh, you'll find some uh, bags, boxes out in the foyer where you're able to bring the items and put them in. Um, we're hoping to uh, collect enough and then bring it to the Abbotsford's community who have been affected by the floods. Uh, some of the things that should be mentioned that we would like, it isn't just, say, cans of food, but unused underwear, socks, uh, toothpaste, toothbrushes, deodorant, laundry soap. These things are also very important. They're non-perishable. Foods like bottled water, rice, cereal, granola bars, canned fruit, canned soup, pet food, because pets have also been affected. These items are also very important. Uh, we hope to have these delivered before or at least on December 5th, so please Come in the middle of the week if you're able to, or when you're dropping off your kids for salt, or even on Sunday morning, please bring your items and put them in the boxes in the foyer. If you'd like to make a financial contribution, you can also do that through Gateway Community Church to Ab uh, Abbotsford uh, Disaster Relief, providing shelter, food, and clothing. Uh, they have a website link in the church bulletin news if you'd like to find a direct link to that. Also, one last thing I'd like to mention is something that our church is trying to put together for good Christmas cheer and to remind us that we are a community. The Special Events Committee is trying to put on a special thing called My Family Christmas Wishes. Uh, they would like people to uh, take 30-second videos of them and their family putting together decorations, Christmas tree decorations, just getting everything ready for good Christmas cheer. And then I'm going to put all those videos together and have them ready to be presented on December 19th. But they'd like to have all those videos in before the 15th of December. Uh, so for details, please check it at icrc.ca. So this is a little thing special committees putting together. It'll show that we are a community, even though we are social distancing, we are still together in Christmas cheer. And so with all that news shared, we now come to a time of message shared with our guest preacher. Hello, good afternoon as well. Uh, such a lovely time to gather again and to uh, be among the midst of those who are willing to um, uh, share some of your gas resources, especially um, to come and join us in person, as well as we are just so thankful for those who are also joining us online. What a blessing it is. Uh, thank you for Pastor Marcus for uh, just reminding how fruitful and how wonderful um, during this Christmas season can be and how we can continue to give back, especially to our community, sharing God's love to so many individuals. So um, today I'm going to join us uh, in the first beginning of the Advent season. And the passage I want to read for you today uh, is actually from Jeremiah. Um, this, I'm actually going to add a couple more verses because I think it's just very prudent to the passage we're going to study today. Jeremiah chapter 33. Can you turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 12 uh, to 16, as well as there will be a, I will also look at Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38 as well. So um, just join with me for Jeremiah 33 in whatever, um, uh, with either the Bible or with an electronic device as well. Uh, I'm going to read from the NIV 1984. So please join, uh, join with me. 
This is what the Lord Almighty say. In this place, desolate and without men or animals, in all its town, there will again be pastures for shepherds to rest their flocks. In the towns of the hill country of the western foothills and of the Negev in the territory of Benjamin, in the villages around Jerusalem, in the towns of Judah, flocks will again pass under the hands of the one who counts them, says the Lord. For the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah, where in those days and at that time I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and what is right in the land, and in those days Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteous. And then I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 2. It's a really short verse, so you can just follow along. And then there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but she worshipped day and night, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at their very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking for it to the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful that in this Advent season, we are uh, encountering you afresh, that we are giving time to realize that there are great and deep longings in our hearts that are seeking and searching for your truth and your hope and especially our fulfillment that can only be found in surprisingly a most lowly state, a little babe that comes. So we pray that during the season, as we learn about the righteous branch, that as we learn about what it means that you are our righteous savior, that we are continuing to be growing and, and be developed, that is putting our identity with you, O oh Lord, during this season. As, as we pray, we leave this message in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I know everybody's very familiar with the Advent season, um, but I think a lot of times when we look at the Advent season, we tend to look at it as sort of an introduction, which really it's not. It's not like some way where we're just kind of building up towards this, you know, Christmas, towards what's happening in the Nativity, because what Advent really is, is about a season of where we are waiting. It's a time where we are actually spending time thinking about longing for something. It's a time where we are hoping for something. And it's also a time where we're anticipating for something. And it's kind of where you're putting yourself out of the frenzy of this Christmas season, you know, the deals, the gifts, the, the wealth, you know, the, res, the relationship. And as the passage there says, we are really looking forward to the redemption. And in Luke, it says redemption of Jerusalem. You see, when we talk about redemption, we're talking about a sense where people are making whole of something which somehow lost its value, or, or maybe even assigning a new value to it. For example, if you may have like, uh, been cooking and you actually put salt instead of sugar into a meal and it suddenly turns out inedible, what are you going to do to redeem it? Well, you're going to rush out. You're going to maybe order takeout, maybe order a pizza or something like that to hopefully redeem that situation. Or perhaps you have had some sort of blunder professionally or relationally and, in, and you work really hard to recover it, to restore it. In some ways, you have redeemed it. And so for those who are looking forward to or waiting for redemption, there's, there is something that in the midst of all that, there is also an experience where we are in darkness, where there is a lot of brokenness, and there is a place where we finding we are without value and without hope. And that somehow that we really need redemption. We really need what redemption does, which is to restore our dignity, restore our brokenness, and restore the hope that in many cases, in a hopeless situation where all seems lost, and especially when we see what's happening around the world, we really need more of that. For, for what it means for us to wait, what it means for us to anticipate, what it means for us to hope, is to realize that we have a deep need that we all really need. And that, on one hand, there is something sad that's going on in our life. But on the other hand, there is hope along the horizon, 
where we are looking for something to redeem. That's why in some ways, when we think about this, we, we are kind of remembering, you know, one of my favorite you know, C.S. Lewis novels about the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's kind of like those citizens of Narnia who are waiting for Aslan, who is on the move in Narnia. And, then, and the reason why they're ho- longing for it is because they have experiencing everything has always been winter, but never Christmas. And so when we're studying this text today of waiting, of hoping, we're going to look at first the setting of waiting, which is like the context. Then we're going to study the second part, which is what does it mean to be waiting in darkness? And then the third that we want to look at is looking at the hope that comes as we wait. Now, jumping into our passage today, we have two contexts. We have one that we find in Jeremiah, we find in Luke, and they're quite different, right? To kind of take a, a, a step back and look through it a little bit more in detail, Jeremiah 33 was written in a situation where there's great sadness and there's great loss. Jerusalem has been in a season where everybody was filled and continue in this idolatrous state. And they have turned their hearts away from God. It gotten so dangerous and so perverse that they have actually even sacrificed children to other idols. Therefore, we were expecting divine judgment was coming. And here, Jerusalem was soon overtaken by Babylon in around uh, 586 to 587 BC. And here, the temple, we know, and the city was destroyed. We also know that everyone will soon be taken captive and all the way into exile. And it's a time where everyone in that space were feeling desolate. It was a time of where we were feeling barren. And it was basically Jerusalem was known as a barren wasteland. And we see that in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 12, that describes it. It says, it's in this place is desolate and without people or animals. It was indeed a time of darkness. But in all of this, there was this time of hope. This is why it also says shortly after that there will once again be pastors for shepherds to rest their flocks where we finally realize that there will be a place where eventually Jerusalem will be restored and people can live safely. And then we fast forward many years, 600 years roughly, in chapter chapter 2 of Luke. You know, I'm thankful that you guys have been going through the book of Luke, so this is not something new. We're introduced to Anna, so our prophetess, who met the baby Jesus for the very first time. We learn that she's been married to her husband for seven years, And so after the death of her husband, she's been a widow until the age of 84. And so, which is quite old, and if we really consider sort of the the time frame, you know, most likely she was married in her teens, and that was acceptable back then. That if we can't do some calculations and things like that, we would probably expect her to be a widow for at least 60 years of her life. So here, after her husband's death, she basically had lived her basically entire lifetime alone. And so when that season in that society where it places a value on on women able to bear children, that means that she experienced basically years of disappointment. She basically faced years of hardship that a widow does. She faced even years of social alienation because she has been, in a sense, devalued and diminished because she is no, not able to do what the society deems as good. In fact, when we look at it, especially from a modern world lens, we find that this is quite you know, regressive and quite dehumanizing for that society where we are valuing women based on you know, childbearing. And I think it is, but it doesn't mean that we also, in our new modern society, in our new modern values, that we have given a proper indication of what really is worth as well. Indeed, when we think about what we value here, especially even in the city of Richmond, we often look at it in terms of what is your academic achievement, what is your professional accomplishment, what is your social reputation around this world, and especially what is, how are you approved by people, especially your families, or even looking at how much zeros are in your bank account. And so when you think about our modern context, 
that in a sense that what she was facing, a scenario where basically any kind of advancement for her entire life was gone, or any acceptance within any social circle she wished she wanted to be a part of is gone, it's like watching her and basically watching, and we put our context in, it's like watching our professional, our social, our reputation, all these opportunities are all gone for years and years and years, 60 in fact. And so if you think about it, it's very relevant to Anna and it's relevant to us. And here, if Anna had been married, she, had, she was at that time, had that future prospect of having a child, and that, we know, the possibility of, and prospect of all that wonderful acceptance died many years ago when her husband died. And so she, had, she understands what it means to have years of longing, years of earning for something different where years she can feel like she has been watching people around her experiencing these great joy and these sense of work that she hoped that she had, but she never came to her. So if you think about it, it's not much different from what happening to the people in Jerusalem, in Jeremiah. It's something happening that's similar to Anna and Luke. In a sense, it's also kind of happening to us now. And what we're experiencing really is a season of darkness. Right? It's, a, it's sort of this season where I think in some ways it's very unique to the way we think of, especially as a Christian. You see, the way oftentimes we look at suffering from a modern lens that is not from a Christian lens is that we sometimes want to look at you know, suffering as a, and harshness as a sort of an illusion. You know, for some who have come from traditions like maybe a Buddhist tradition, you can't find that the way to escape suffering or harshness that you have to realize that it's not real. That in some ways, what you really need to be is to be enlightened out of it. And then on the other hand, some of us may have been influenced in sort of a Western idea of sort of a Gnostic dualism where, you know, the world is broken, material is broken, and that our spirituality is good, and our goal is to tough it out and wait for that day when we can s separate from that, separate from our bodies, separate from our material. But the Christian approach is quite different from this. It doesn't say that suffering is some sort of illusion and doesn't tells us that suffering is about trying to endure and to tough it out. What it says is that in our darkness, in our sadness and grief, that is where we encounter God. And somehow it, was, it is in that darkness, in that barrenness, that somehow C.S. Lewis once wrote that pain is like a megaphone from God, designed to sort of grab our attention, alert us, as a way sort of a out from suffering is that is how we experience God in the midst of darkness. And the way we can move forward in our suffering and in our hardship is not by pretending it's not there, nor is it buckling down, but it's actually to meet God in darkness, and that's what kind of, in a sense, where Abbott begins. It begins in darkness. It begins in sort of a desperation that we find that everything is a loss. And that's when God will come to you to meet you and bring you hope. And if you think about it, and if we don't jump ahead too quickly to our next point, it's a good way to kind of do some reflection that are you in a particular area, is there a season in your life where you're experiencing great darkness, where are you really ignoring it, hoping and pretending it's not there and just kind of like, oh, it's not a big deal? Or are you trying to tough it out and wait for that, the end of it? Or has it been for you during these seasons a time where you met God in the darkness? Which kind of naturally moves us to our second point, to understand what it means to be waiting in darkness. Now, if we go back to the chapter in Luke, uh, chapter one and two, we hear, we actually find ourselves seeing not just one story about our, our longing for the child through the lens of Anna. We also see the many different story narratives that happen surrounding the birth of the child, where we see, in a sense, many different individuals who come to meet Jesus at different stages in their life. 
We have, for example, one who is like an older couple, parents of the John the Baptist, who were suddenly surprised that after so many years of waiting, they were finally having a child. There is a story of Mary who, you know, a poor young girl having faced a lifetime of being socially outcast uh, for being an unwed mother and suddenly surprised with a child even before she was married. There was this old man, Simeon, and this old woman, Anna, and they are sort of at the end of their lives, near to their death and waiting for decades. And here they are, worshiping night and day and waiting for salvation to come. So what Luke is trying to bring us and draw us and help point out during this season is that it doesn't matter where you're at. What the, what the Christmas story brings about everybody is that every person at every stage, at every age, in every life situation can all find their place in the story of Jesus. It's something that everyone can relate to. That as some of us who are wading through, especially during this season, some hard situations in our lives where we are really suffering, where we are having a very dark and deep seasons of darkness, where we're hoping for some resolution to our problems or waiting for some injustice to end or finding hopefully redemption in our own place to find incomplete, where we are finding ourselves incomplete, what God is telling us is to be cautious about some things where on one hand we have to be cautious that in these hard situations we don't become hard and brittle and cynical where we in a sense put ourselves in these experience of darkness not towards god but towards this sort of entitled bitterness where we go around going that god you should have to fix this i don't deserve this how after all i have done for you i have done good in this world how should I be, why am I still experiencing all this? I should be much in a better situation. I deserve better. But it also takes us away from this other problematic view of darkness where we are in this, perhaps for some of us, going through a moment of sadness, maybe through chronic illness for many years, maybe, you know, being displaced from your home by the flood, and so forth and so on that we don't also become sort of resigned to our bitterness, where we become self-pitying, right? Where we, in some ways, is weirdly enough that we become proud of the darkness. God, look at what I'm enduring or suffering for you. I guess misery is just the way of life. You know, it's almost kind of like, that's it. And here, the passage is really helping us to see that bitterness is is in a sense saying something is wrong with God. Self-pitying is saying there's something wrong with me, and neither of those things are what is being defined by darkness. Because in this darkness, especially through the book of Jeremiah, God's showing us that there is a way out, a way to deal with this darkness, which actually comes in a branch. All right this righteous branch. Now, we have kind of spent time studying what the righteous branch is, looking at the prophets. We see it in the book of Isaiah. We see it in the book of Jeremiah. It's sort of an idea that comes where it's almost a, a branch coming from a fallen tree that out of that little branch will come forth new life. In some ways, when we look at that little, little branch, it is sort of this very tender, very vulnerable shoot. In some sense, it is unassuming, not something great to look at. But yet, it is something that can sprout new life, that out of it, it can be spring forth out of a season where there's death, out of a fallen tree, out of, in its essence, a fallen kingdom of Jerusalem. And from this tiny, insignificant new life, God will bring forth a whole new life that will grow into a whole new kingdom that will be even more powerful and much stronger than the one that King David used to rule. In a sense, there's going to be a shepherd king who will be ushering from his seat of throne. There will be, uh, in the sense that there will be a restoration of the destruction of Jerusalem. And even amongst all this injustice, this just and right king will bring forth 
all those who are exiled to a point where he is going to be the shepherd king, the king who knows his sheep. And that's why we see in verses 12, it says, uh, sorry, verses, I think 12, yeah, uh, sorry, verses 13, where it says that flocks will again pass under the hands of the ones who count them, which basically saying he knows his sheep and the sheep knows him. And this is why they are to wait in darkness. In fact, what waiting really means is that if you think about waiting, waiting really is in great partnership, almost can be separate from the process of growing. Have you ever tried growing anything? I've, I've tried growing a few things at our planter boxes and, <laughs> and plants. Um, not 100% successful, still learning. But for those who have tried to grow vegetables or fruits or, or even the plants, you know, or even like if you have children, helping your children grow, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, right? It requires a lot of attention. It requires us taking, making sure we're giving it lots of care. And we pray that one day it's going to be mature, it's going to be fruitful, it's going to be amazing. But somehow, at this moment, day to day, you're going to find that the growth is so minuscule that it's almost like impossible to detect, right? And here we are asked to tend to it at the same time while we wait for it, yet at the same time not seeing much growth from it. And that's why it's amazing how Jesus was so wise in, in mentioning how the kingdom of God is often looked in agricultural terms, where like things like, for example, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Smallest seed you can find. Unexpected too, vulnerable, easy to overlook. But if you give it some time, if you provide attention, if you're waiting, it tends to grow into one of the greatest and largest among all the plants. And in a sense, where the trees will kind of find their rest in that tree. Or perhaps we have heard about the kingdom of God is like the east, where if you put a small amount, it will be able to permeate and leaven the entire loaf. And here, the hope of this righteous branch is the same hope Anna also received when she saw the baby Jesus for the first time. Because when she looked at Jesus, it was at the very beginning. It was unassuming. It was vulnerable as an infant, easy to look at. But giving it time, give it time for it to grow, it will become the new reality for the entire world. This is, will be the tree that will, where everything, all plants will be under. A kingdom that will be greater than all other kingdoms. A savior who is born in this world, who is born in darkness, who's going to become one day the shepherd king, who will then dispel all darkness. And so by saying that Jesus is coming in this world, not so much as displaying great power, and dis but displaying weakness, not as the great warrior everybody expected, but as a servant, not as someone who, you know, commands the, an army of angels of light who can clear the darkness, but he actually comes during darkness. And if you are attentive, it will grow in your life. And if you're able to hope in what he will, come, he will become, and if you're able to wait and wade through these dark times, we'll find that he will become the redemption of this world. He'll grow and become the shepherd king who will meet us in our darkness and dispel the darkness one day. So what is the one most difficult thing for people to come to Christianity? And I think this is kind of, kind of shares a little bit about that. It's not so much that it's, it's, it's great difficulty, which it is challenging. But I think what's so difficult about Christianity is that oftentimes it starts off so small and so vulnerable. Is that it begins with a shoot that is growing from a dead stump. In a sense, Bethlehem, a forgettable town, backwater part of the empire of Rome, in a manger no less than a throne, to be a tiny infant instead of a great warrior, a vulnerable child, and he's going to become the savior of the world, and it requires us to wait. Will you wait? 
But here's the thing. The great thing about this, these two passages, it teaches us is that we don't just be resigned to not doing anything while we wait. In fact, what we can turn to is look at Anna and how she waited. And what does she do in her wait? And that gives us a lot of ideas of how we should think about when we wait. See, when she first laid eyes on Jesus, she gave thanks to God. Because she, she sees that the child represents something far more than what she saw. It was the redemption of Jerusalem. And it's also something that, frankly, she doesn't deserve. It's not something that she could demand for it. It's not something that she can know, like, oh, yeah, I know when it's going to come. But what's so surprising is that whatever it's really from God it tends to come to you, not you try to grasp it by yourself. And so here she was, being a widow for many years, her life dark and barren, as we have said, never having a child, being told many times again and again that she's not worthy. And here, instead of a, a, a having bore a child, a child comes to her. And now she says that this child will, can dispel all the darkness in her life, and especially all of the world. And so what did she respond? And how did she respond? It teaches a lot of things. In fact, the Bible speaks of very specific things here, too. Uh, it says that she was fasting and praying. It says that she worshipped day and night. Uh, it says that she was speaking about him. Yeah, and then it also says that she waited. And so perhaps we can elaborate on those a little bit more. What, is, what does it mean to be fasting and praying, right? Here, fasting and praying are simply really focused acts of waiting. Fasting is sort of kind of like where you are self-denying yourself of maybe food, maybe technology, you know, unplugging our, our phones or internet. Uh, it's a season where we're actively saying that we are waiting for God. Where fasting is the attempt of trusting that God is the only one who will satisfy me. He's the only one who can fulfill me. So that's why I will unplug myself from all the distractions of the world. That's fasting. Then what's prayer? Prayer is basically saying that we are not in control of anything. That God is the one who has the strength. He's the one who's going to provide for me when I need help. He's going to provide the light in my darkness, the hope when I'm hopeless, that he is going to be it maybe in this season that while I'm waiting for you, you, that glimmer of hope, that glimmer of light that you've seen will one day shine so brightly like the sun to where it will dispel all types of darkness in my life. And that, in a sense, is prayer and fasting. But there's also worshiping. She worshiped. And so worship is kind of in the sense where, we're compare, where we are looking into our hearts and examining it and looking at what we put as the most important thing in our life. A lot of times when we examine our heart, we realize that when we worship, we're all, we have a lot of impatience. We often tend to you know, love all kinds of things. And we always think that, you know, we are distracted to these places where there are relationships, approval, comfort, maybe wealth, that these things may satisfy me, but frankly, they are just illusions. They do not. Because we realize that they will fail you, but what doesn't fail you is God's love for us. So guess what? I worship. I'm thankful praise the Lord, and I wait on him. And what we read that is so amazing about Anna, that when we look at it, is that, you know, after it says that she was worshiping day and night, we never learn if she ever left the temple, right? Almost to say that, um, well, I'm not trying to encourage a mass uh, decision to come away from your house and make this church your, like, physical space to live in for long periods of time. You know, unless you are really, your house is flooded and you need to leave, right? Uh, I, I can't experience that personally, but on a separate note. But it, it just means that here Anna was practicing worship day in and day and evening, 
right? She was reading about scripture. She was singing and worshiping. She was speaking about Jesus. And suddenly her life was filled because she was filled with worship all day long. But there's not just that. We also know that there's a last part that she did actively, which is she spoke about this child, where she isn't being passive or indifferent. She is sort of waiting as a way of expected hope. In fact, if we think about what hope really is, this waiting period where she spoke about the child, it really leads us into the activity into this world where we're speaking. Here we see in Jeremiah, they are speaking about what is just and right in this land. We see that here, she's talking about what is right and just in this land. It's about the child. In the same ways, we are called to kind of move beyond just our, our understanding or listening or words, but we are asked and called to speak about the child through our words to others, to our actions, to perhaps our acts of justice, of compassion and kindness, you know, where we are addressing what is in need of this. And I, I think I remember hearing about this where it says that, uh, where this person said, without co- I can't remember where, but without causative action, hope can often soften into sentimentality, but with costly action, hope may harden into reality. So what makes the gospel so hard to believe is not that it's too big, again, but it begins so small. And so for us to identify with Christ means that we have to somehow agree that we are more like this poor and vulnerable child born in the world of darkness than we are a, 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 a person of rich men, of international influence, of great wealth, of houses that are so expensive that we don't know how we afford them. But the truth is, we also learn that it's other illusion to believe that we can overcome this darkness on our own. Which kind of brings us back to what Advent is. Um, I was reading this article in Christianity Today, which talks about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a uh, a familiar probably among you, a, a German Lutheran minister and a sort of an anti-Nazi supporter as well. Uh, and so he was jailed for, you know, very vocal about being anti-Nazi, especially which is he is strongly against biblical uh, convictions. And so he's, this is what he wrote about Advent. He said, a prison cell like this is a good analogy for Advent, where it says one waits, hopes, does this or that, ultimately negligible things because the door is locked and only be open from the outside. And here he's almost saying that this is why waiting is so hard because it requires us to wait upon someone who has the power and the control of the situation that they can lock the door. That in the sense that we must wait on someone who's more powerful than us. And you know what, we really hate waiting. You know, we hate waiting so much that we are more than happy to not wait for a TransLink bus. We'd rather drive, right? Or if anybody been to a restaurant and have to wait on their order for quite a long time, you know, we feel that we dislike it so much is because we feel like the way our food will arrive or when the bus will come is totally not dependent on us. It's under the control of someone else. So, and especially if you ever identify yourself with the infant, if you know, if you have children yourselves, especially young kids, you really, those kids literally have no control over anything. They need someone to help them change. They need someone to help them be fed. They need someone to help them to be bathed. That they are utterly dependent on someone else. And if we identify with this child, this vulnerable, tender shoots, and especially we identify him in the darkness, we're going to find ourselves ex- extremely vulnerable. We're going to find ourselves especially in the dark. We also find ourselves also extremely in waiting for that shepherd king who will dispel this darkness in our hearts and in our life and in this world. And that is what really gives us hope. 
And so, will you wait? Will you wait on God? Will you long for him? Will you wait for him to be our Lord, our righteous Savior? Let's pray. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that we can be identified with you, that we have a chance to remove our insecurities and place all our hope, all our dependency upon you, that we are so freeing to realize there is someone far stronger and greater than us who will help us to open our door that, in a way out of darkness. It is also that we have an opportunity to be transformed, that we can, in our time where we are waiting for this, we can be worshipers. We can be fasting and praying. We can speak of you through our words and actions. That we are not just sitting here and waiting in self-pity or wallowing in, in bitterness, but we are, in fact, free. Free to experience the joy of this coming King. So I pray that, Lord, may you continue to walk and transform us so that we, too, find great freedom in identifying with your Son, Jesus Christ. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing to our King that we want to encounter and experience Him. Focus in waiting, worshiping, and speaking of Him. Wherever we are, as individuals, as a family, and as a community. King of heaven, come down. Jesus, let your kingdom come. Jesus, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here. In us, Jesus, there is no one greater. You alone are Savior. Show the world your love.
Let your glory reign, shining like the day, King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stay the test us? You are strong to save in your mighty name, King of heaven, come. Let's remain standing as Pastor Perry gives us the benediction. Uh, let us end by t- reading from First Thessalonians 3. It says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen, just as one does for you. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus come with all his holy ones. Amen. Let's all be seated in silent prayer. <clears throat>